Pro Wrestling Spotlight, presented by Hami Media and the Pro Wrestling Reflection, where we discuss the very best of the best in pro wrestling history. And what you gonna do when Hulkamania and the largest arms in the world run wild on you? The two soundest wrestlers in the World Wrestling Federation, maybe in the history of the World Wrestling Federation, are right here, right now. Mr. Perfect and the excellence of execution, the Hitman. WrestleMania weekend isn't complete without the heartbreak kid, and he is on his way. He put hard times on Dusty Rhodes and his family. They think they got the answers. I change the question. You will rest in peace. Get used to it in Ric Flair. Who you're looking at, the man. Happy New Year, Reflection Nights. Happy 2020. Oh, let me try one. Happy 2023. Yes, I'm going to like that. I think I like that. Happy 2023. We're, we're, we're kind of experiment because, you know, we had 2020 Unos, 2020 Deuces. I don't know about the 2023. So we're going to try 2023. But if TW finds another better saying, then we'll roll with that. So right now, happy 2023 to the Magnificent Seven, the Elite Eight, the Naughty Nine, the True of the Ten. You know who we are. You know, it's been a whole year of reflection. I missed y'all. Did you miss us? Did you miss the PWR podcast at the pwlsonnetworks.podbean.com? Did you miss us, Reflectionites, on the Hami Media Group at podbean.com? Did you miss us, Vetoites, at the big Vito brand at website.com? We sure did miss you. So, you know, did, did you Hustleites miss us on the PWSL Networks on the YouTubes? We sure missed you. But anyway, welcome or welcome to the PWR podcast. It is I. You know the spiel. We're going on year seven, and you know, I'm still magnanimous. We're going on year seven, and I'm scholarly. We're going on year seven, I'm effervescent. We're going on year seven, and I'm stupendous. But most importantly, we're going on year seven, and I'm still glorious. The only objective man in this IWC, YWC, PWC punditry. Your friend of mine, the Professor Chabel. Cabello Bella Cruz got a little tongue twister. You know, must have been drinking a lot of champagne on the New Year's, but neither here nor there. I'm I'm riding with y'all. I and standing to my left or my, on your right on the video screen is your friend and mine. My brother from another mother. The conservative liberal, the liberal conservative, Mr. Dum Dum Dual Idiots on the Iron Stomach One, Dr. Freaking Stein himself. The ladies love him. The Tommy Wonder. Not only the ladies, but the non-binaries. Too, they love him too. So what's going on? Happy New Year, my friend. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Happy 2020. Trace. Trace. Come on. You know, Dose. Trace. Okay. Dose, we dose. did Deuce, but we did Deuce. But, you know, okay. I get I get yeah. you. 2020 Trace. You, you, you just took a Deuce with your front door unlocked. And a- ALC mm-hmm. almost stormed the gates. But you got your super to get her out of here. That's that's good. That's no. Good if, a- if AOC was coming at my door, yeah, I would let her in with open arms. Yep. I would let her storm this capital. But you know, I, that's a, that's <laughs> another show for another day. But anyway, you know, before we get a, get into the show, reflection nights, hustle lights, Hami nights, all the ites out there, Israelites, left, right, them repubs. We do record this midweek. Hustle So, you know, I just want to say this. If you're not a football fan, you know, I'm not going to get into the logistics. But we want to say a little prayer to the man representing the, the Buffalo Bills. The man, you know, his name is Demir Hamblin. And he took a nasty hit. And we're not going to get political. We're not going to get philosophical. We're not going to get conspiratory here. All we just do, want to do, all, for me, I'm just going to extend my heart and prayers to him. His family, the Buffalo Bills, you know, because it's a it's a bad thing. It was a bad hit. It's a freak accident. 
you know, for wrestling terms, if you don't watch Monday Night Football to the Reflection Nights out there, you remember the the move TW, the heart punch? Yep. Literally, what we saw a couple of days ago is the heart punch, but it was with the with, with the crown of the helmet. It hit the area at the pinpoint era, and then he got up, and he went down. The system shut down. So, you know what? Thank God Scary. for the EMTs. Thank God for the doctors. You know, and let's hope for a speedy recovery. Football ain't an important thing. I just want him to walk. I want him to hold his kids. I want him to hold his younger brother. I want him to go back to Buffalo with that charity, you know, that, you know, the toys for the underprivileged kids already sell it, already five million dollars. All he wanted yeah. was two twenty five hundred. So kudos to a lot of people. I'm gonna I'm gonna donate to the GoFundMe myself. So the professor's gonna do it. And if the professor does it, I acknowledge all the reflection I you know, twenty five dollars ain't that much. Put a little twenty five dollars, put a little twenty dollars, it don't matter. Whatever you can for him. Just to that's that's the nurturing that we as a society can do for him. Out of the tragedy, we help. Let's say you TW, and then we'll get the show going. I I just read a lot of that, and it's funny because I when I read it, it was four million, but it was an article from earlier in the day, and since then Tom Brady and a bunch of other uh, football players donated to it too, which is cool that people didn't stop just because it hit the twenty five hundred, right? Like mm-hmm. he's pro- he's probably trying to hook up some kids just in the neighborhood or whatever. Now they're going to be able to hook up many kids in many neighborhoods and. And, you know, maybe that's something when he when he's awake and he hears it's something that, you know, makes him feel like, wow, something good from the bad. Um, Mm -hmm. I did read that it officially was a heart attack. And so that makes me feel good that, you know, I thought about this all day, like, wow, you know, if he that happens anywhere else. There's not medical staff there like there is in the NFL to save his life. Um, My ex-wife's stepfather, he was on uh, one of those elevator walk things you know where you can not mm-hmm. elevator walk but the moving but like sidewalk. the train the moving trams yeah yeah and so him and my ex-mother-in-law they're they're trying to get around this heavier set woman you know because they're doing the layover they're in florida they're trying to get back to the or carolina i believe and coming back from florida and they're trying to get around her and they can't right and mm-hmm. and it's kind of it's kind of like it's not as horrible as it sounds like she's a big woman. They're just trying to get past her. She's mm-hmm. in the middle instead of staying off to the side like people do when they know you're trying to pass them. And she yeah. has no idea. They're rushing. It's, uh, I've, I've been to a layover where the plane that I was laying over with was was boarding 15 minutes before the plane I was coming on was even there. Yeah, so you're on I, a time thing when you're yeah, doing it. You're trying to connect. Yeah, I, flight, I get you. Right. Yeah. So anyways, um, as soon as it got to the end of the walk, they went around her and he collapsed and had a heart attack right there on the scene. That woman yeah. saved his life. She gave him CPR. So if they would have blew around her on that thing and got up at the end, she wouldn't have been there. And who knows if someone else would have been there to, you know, to do CPR. And then the secondary thing is there were police officers escorting a prisoner through the airport and they had those paddles. So she mm-hmm. kept them alive until the paddles could get there, which got there quick because they were walking past so, you know, God sometimes puts us in the right place at the right time when something like that happens. Other times, um, mm-hmm. just unfortunate to be far away from stuff like that. But I also want to say, I've been praying for that guy too, but um, Jeremy Renner too. Like, I've been keeping up on him. He He's in critical condition in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Pray for him too. Yeah. Like, my kids just said to me, can you pay people to do that? And I'm like, nah, the guy owns a, a ranch, a farm. He probably prides himself on keeping his ranch. I don't know exactly what happened. I just know he was snow. It's probably where he gets his zen, you know, his right. moment of clarity. It's, and just Like I said on Facebook once, cutting grass. When you live with somebody, it's an escape. When you don't live with somebody, it makes you want to pay someone else to do it. So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, like it's a chore. My, it's yeah. a chore, yeah. Mm-hmm. But when you got other people in the house that you're trying to get away from, it's zen, like you just said, yeah. So, Absolutely. And then I didn't know the other guy, but uh, Kenny Block, I guess he created DC clothing or DC shoes, and he passed away. Uh, he Of the three of them, he's actually gone. I think he had an accident in a race car or something, but some Mm -hmm. of my friends knew who he was. I didn't, uh, but you know, God rest his soul too. So, Mm -hmm. so I'm sure anyone listening to a wrestling podcast might be into other sports as well. And I know they're in the Marvel. There's no two ways about it. So pretty heavy. I mean, again, yeah, it's pretty heavy to start off. And Don West, 
Yeah, oh, man, that's heavy. Week. He was he was battling, so you know yeah. the, the angels called. So you know yeah. he's gonna be selling those McGuire, M- Mark McGuire rookie cars in heaven. So you know rest <laughs> in heaven to Don West. So we're dedicating this podcast on the wrestling spectrum. TW, thank you for saying this to Don West. Maybe we'll do a future TNA episode. You know, in the coming weeks with a Don West. So this way TW can enjoy the the commentary stylings of Don West and Mike Tanae. So I'll find that for you. But now let's get into what we're going to do. The first episode of the 2020 dress here at the PWR podcast. And it is PWR Spotlight. And we had so much fun. It was a success in the professor's eyes when we did the spotlight for the greatest heel turn. I said, why not flip it? We did the heel turn. It's only apropos that we do the greatest babyface turn. And again, this is very subjective for the IWC, YWC, TW. So I decided to pick one of your favorite matches, but the end result is one of the most famous memories in wrestling lore, too. I'm not saying it's the greatest babyface turn, but it's the most memorable for many, many reasons. And we're gonna die, we're gonna, you know, get into the crust. Of Macho Man Randy Savage, or at the time, Macho King Randy Savage, yeah. turning turning face after 1991's WrestleMania 7 match against the Ultimate Wars. So, TW, we talked about how, you know, Barry Windham was the, was the turn you didn't see coming. So, in your thought process, I'm not saying that we, you know, I think we could see this coming a mile away. <laughs> This match was very special because it was a retirement match. The loser was going to be supposedly, quote unquote, retired from the WWF at WrestleMania 7. This was one of the biggest matches on the card, only behind Hulk Hogan and Sergeant Slaughter for the title. But this was a big effing deal. So, TW, we'll talk about all the parlays. I'll try to give the backstory, and then we're going to talk about what happened afterwards. But let's just focus on the here and the now that match. You've talked about it. This is your second favorite match of all time behind Steamboat and Savage. And I I cannot dispute that, Steamboat and Savage. But, again, your number two is still one of the most memorable number twos in the history of wrestling lore. Probably people will say to you, nah, your your match is maybe three, four, five. You know, Undertaker and uh, Shawn Michaels, maybe Hell in the Cell with Foley and Undertaker. Again, that's subjective. This is TW's number two, and I'm respecting TW's number two. Why? There's asterisks. There's asterisks. Okay. If you notice, Steve of Savage and Warrior and Savage have one thing in common besides WrestleMania. Savage. WrestleMania. It's before I was a wrestler. So mm-hmm. I've probably seen a million matches that were great, but I'm not looking at it through the eyes of a fan like I was before I, I started wrestling. And I... I don't mean that as some kind of pompous thing. It's something I wish I couldn't do. I wish I could just watch as a fan, which is why I was telling you NXT somehow made me a fan again. It just mm-hmm. did. It just I enjoyed the hell of it. You know, I'm getting back into it now, but I mean, you know what I mean? The, yeah. the Adam Cole era, uh, all that stuff. And so in, in reality, I mean, War Games is probably it might oh, any of them, pick one. Pick a War Games with, with the Undisputed Era in it, and it's probably – surpassed both of those matches but again it's, I, I get you it's, it's looked at through a different lens so yes Shawn michaels versus the undertaker was great i think what dilutes it is there's two of them so mm-hmm. yes the heaven to hell one is the one that everybody thinks is the greatest one which i think is the first one yeah. um and but that one i i think i think what makes it better me, me saying that about the ones i like is the emotional investment taker versus michaels won doesn't have the same emotional investment. It's just two icons fighting, trying to beat the streak, but Sean had nothing to lose. The second one is when streak versus retirement, and you almost knew Sean was losing, right? Like mm-hmm. there was no. Uh, right. But with Warrior and Savage, I've told you, I it's the only time I ever turned on the Warrior because I didn't want Savage to retire, right? And then mm-hmm. the way it ended, I was like, you motherfucker. Like, but, but that's it. That's the, but I also didn't want the Warrior to retire either. So. In, in hindsight, I think everybody and their brother knew the Warrior was not losing, but they did a damn good job of making it look like he was M- more than once. Once by being pinned and once by leaving. So it, it, it was just, it's just, it's got, it's got the emotional roller coaster. I think you need to make something stand the test of time. Also, Steamboat versus Flair 
Uh, and I'm not even sure which one because I liked all three of them. But most likely the one that Steamboat won the belt is probably the Shy one. Shytown Rumble. Like, Shytown Rumble. Uh, yeah. sa- same thing there. You know, a guy who I feel got mistreated, you know, and, and this is before I knew the politics and the, the script, if you will. Mm-hmm. But to go from the highest of highs of winning that IC title in front of the largest crowd ever at the time to losing it to a Honky Tonk Man on Superstars, mm-hmm. to me, even as a kid who didn't know wrestling wasn't on the up and up, it felt like, what? Like, what? How, how do you nah. look? I think Honky, honky held totally. the ropes or something. Right. Totally, totally understand. Like, like You're very uh, in sync, not Justin Timberlake's in sync, but you're very in sync with what you're saying with as long as we're let's keep it with warrior and savage this right, right, right. was a roller coaster of emotions on either scale so right. reflection i said let me try to give you the parlay of this it's 1991 you know we're a couple of weeks into tw is it desert storm or desert shield but you know what i'm talking about storm okay it, it, we're coming off when, well, because it's starting up and, you know, everybody's getting patriotic. So you and I would agree that the number one bad guy in WWF is unequivocally, undeniably, Sergeant Slaughter because of his alliance and allegiance to Saddam Hussein, his allegiance to Iraq and all this stuff. The patriotic angle of that. of that. So if you're pro-America, you hated the shit out of Sergeant Slaughter and it proved it because you wanted to kill him. And there's stories about that. But number two on the top heels of WWF. Would you agree or disagree on this, TW, that Macho Man Randy Savage or Macho King Randy Savage was number two on the list? And the reason I say this is because starting in 1991, because of Sergeant Slaughter being patriotic, Macho King is the, the, let's just say the gatekeeper of the mid-card, the gatekeeper of the tier below Hulk Hogan's, uh, you know, main event spot. So when you're fighting Macho Man Randy Savage, you're on the high tier of that card. And of course, Reflectionize, what did Macho Man want? He wanted a shot at the title. And who was holding the title? What are you doing? Are you You'll holding? see. Oh, my God. Every time I'm doing a soliloquy, this motherfucker is opening <laughs> something in front of us. I, I, it, it wasn't planned. It wasn't planned or I would have had it open. Already. But anyway. Like I said, Macho Man is number two, but he wants the WWF title. And who was holding that title in the beginning of 1991, Reflection Nights? Of course, the Ultimate Warrior. And everything started at the Royal Rumble in 1991. Macho Man sent out Queen Sherry, not begging him for a title match, TW, but trying to try to. Well, that's, well, you could. Well, again. You know, you could you could use your visuals reflectionized, but TW is kind of right. Uh, there was a backdoor deal between Macho Man and, and Slaughter for getting that title shot opportunity, which never manifested, but neither here nor there. That's logistical. But he used Queen Sherry. TW, if you can't open it, please just give, give it give it up. Man, I'm almost there. Give it up. I'm done. This so is a pet you, peeve of mine. You, I know, but give it up. It, it's messing no, up my flow. I know, but just show I'm them. Done. I'm okay. done. Okay, but, but anyway, they, <laughs> they put these zip ties on there, like, like, the, like, dude. It used to be this for my kids' toys, Barbie dolls. They sew the hair into the packaging, like someone's going around boosting Barbie dolls in the store. It's insane. I'm just right, saying, you know, you know, reflection. You know, Don of Destruction is like this. He's he's working out. He's gonna be like, ah, damn, I'm hearing something opening. <laughs> Don't disturb out of destructions and work out mode. Don't disturb this group. But anyway, you and I know that Queen Sherry was trying to blow the Ultimate Warrior and trying to get a title opportunity. And of course, the Ultimate Warrior refused the blowjob and said unequivocally, undeniably, Reflection Knights, hell no to wanting to give Macho Man Randy Savage a title opportunity, which entails. TW that he was not a fighting champion. He was scared right. of Macho King. It was very King. unwarrior-like. I, yeah, I, I thought that when I saw it. So, but, you know, long story short, Macho King Randy Savage and Sensational Queen Sherry got into got involved in the match between Warrior and Slaughter at the Royal Rumble and cost the Ultimate War the WWF title. And, of course, Sergeant Slaughter is the WWF champion going into Mania 7. 
But again, TW, like I told you, I had MSG Network. And this was very prevalent because Warrior and Savage was touring the highways and byways and doing, you know, the MSG, MSG uh, uh, loop with the Boston Garden, the Meadowlands, the Capitol Center, and all that stuff, the Baltimore, era, Baltimore Arena, whatever you want to call it. But they were doing a lot of Macho Man versus Ultimate Warrior cage matches. So I was already amp seeing this shit. So <laughs> what did they do, Reflection Nights, to up the ante? Well, you know, WrestleMania was coming around the course. So this is January towards the end of March, early April. I forgot when WrestleMania 7 was. Was it the end of March, TW? Or April, the early April. They like, the they the last like week April. of March or the first week of April, Reflection Nights. Don't, don't quote me on that. But you know what it is. You had to build. You. I can you had, you. Okay. You had to build. On the storyline. You. you had to build on the storyline. And of course, how do you up the ante with this war, TW? You had to make it career versus career. So, TW, what say you? Because, again, we have to be fair. The, you know, WWF superstars and WWF wrestling challenge, even, even for something that you and I were so, you know, yeah. invested in, knowing that this was going to be the career versus career match. You know, they, they didn't really do a lot. There, were, there was a contract signing. There might have been a run-in during the Saturday night's main event or maybe the main event, if I'm not mistaken. So, TW, how amped were you to know that this match was going to culminate as a career versus career match? Maybe I was you angry. had. I was well, angry. Because before that, wait, wait, wait. Favorite. Let me ask you this as a part A question before you, keep, you, you, you answer your question. In the Detroit Rock City area, in the local area, was there a Macho Man – warrior match for like maybe the joe lewis arena oh for the localized sure, television at this point i'm in high school still it's my senior year um this is this is before he left right who the warrior yeah yeah he got fired after summerslam who did he work at summerslam hogan against the triangle of terror with slaughter and and the Sheik and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So th this is before that he made the save with Papa Shango and and uh, yeah, that was ninety two. So it was a year later. So I wasn't going to the house shows then, right? Like, okay, I went to the house shows when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Um, and my buddies who are huge Warrior fans, our group text is called Lincoln Warriors, our high school. Mm -hmm. Um. They refused to go to a WWE show until the Warrior came back. So, needless to say, the first Warrior show back in town, and I think he fought Papa Shango uh, some at, at at Palace of Auburn Hills. But before that, I didn't really pay attention to the loops. But if they were coming to New York back then, they were coming to Detroit, Chicago, Boston. Mm -hmm. They weren't hitting Poe Dunk. You know, Idaho. Yeah, th this is a big match. I, I yeah. knew MSG had the steel cage match. I saw that on MSG Network. I'm just asking you if you had it on your Detroit Rock City, like local television for WWF uh, purposes. So most likely there was, but you didn't go to the show. I get you. So you expound on why you was angry knowing that they had to up the ante to get to WrestleMania 7 to have this let's say the second main event because this was the main event this was a double main event even though this was a halfway to the card this was a main event because this is career versus career why were you angry because you had to pick and choose between your heroes or your march favorites? 20 march 24th 1990 wonder um okay because because you know again you know before the warrior came around my top five wrestlers were usually heels and it was mm -hmm. savage it was perfect it was it was rick rude and then razor ramon uh which obviously the warriors there before razor but um I, I just was big into the heels and and macho man was always number one on that list maybe mr perfect eventually but mm -hmm. for sure macho man and and he, he was just fun like and if you think about it these two are the same person, right? Like, for whatever reason, over the years, people, you know, obviously they, they thankfully towards the end, like, he, if you're going to die the way the warrior dies, he, he died with the Cinderella story. Because everything that unfolded for him the four days prior to passing away was all you could ask for, right? Mm -hmm. All bridges rebuilt, all, all old, you know, he, he, he buried the hatchet with Hogan. He buried the hatchet with Vince. He buried the hatchet with, you know, everyone. Still, some guys probably still talk shit about him. But when he died, then people kind of like, 
stop doing that, right? So, but when you talk about promos, they both were over the top, made no fucking sense half the time. But as a kid, you were like either with the warrior, like, fuck it. Hopefully there's a seat behind the cockpit because I'm coming with you. And if you were savage, you're like, all right, I'm scared of shit. Like, what I, like even if you weren't cheering for him, you were afraid that he was going to do what he said he was going to do to your favorite wrestler. And I, oddly enough, we're talking about this face turn. I was all in on Macho when he helped Hogan when he became the face the first time and formed the mega powers, right? Like mm. I, I, I want to say the mega powers was the beginning of the end of me being the Hulkamaniac first and foremost. And that allowed me to eventually like the warrior more than I ever liked Hogan. Uh, and so, and Luger and, and Bret Hart, you know, uh, I love Hogan. I wouldn't have this fucking room if it wasn't for Hulk Hogan. That's the dude that just, he made it. He, he made it all like, cool like he's the reason kids could talk about it in school and adults could talk about it at work but these two guys savage is a face i feel like hogan did to savage the same thing he did to warrior cut their title reign short whispered in vince's ear hey these guys aren't drawn let me put the belt back on me let me show you how to make some money and and again without even realizing that was going on there was something about hogan that just i'm like what no, man, leave Macho Man alone. So when Savage became the bad guy, I still cheer for Hogan. And so mm -hmm. <clears throat> when he fought Warrior, it was like, man, I love both of these guys, and I don't want either one to retire. And then you you, you go in your head, you're like, well, Warrior's 10 years younger, so you know what? Uh, okay, Savage, bye. And also, you're fucking green and don't realize no one retires. I was just mm -hmm. reading about, uh, I was listening to Jarek's podcast today about how less than six months after losing to Shawn Michaels, Ric Flair is wrestling for Impact Wrestling, like on a full run, like not even a one-off, and like just dis disparages the whole point of retirement matches. So I like the term "loser leaves town" better than retirement. Mm. No, I, I get you. You know, again, logistically, we know that wrestlers don't retire. Mick Foley retired so many times that I lost count on that too. Ric Flair had his last match. 20 years in a row so again, <laughs> either he's 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 the kiss this is what okay for the reflection guys who are on audio tw was opening a box it took a while but you heard it finally he did it and this is the wrestlemania 7 garb that he wore and that's very very prevalent because now tw let's talk about that hold that up a little bit for all the youtube reflection guys that are going to see this because what I want to acknowledge right now first is the ultimate war. We already know how Macho Man Randy Savage entered the ring. We already know how Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heaton played this as a big effing deal. Because, again, for WWF pay-per-views, especially in 91, you only had maybe two or three title matches the most. So you didn't really have a lot of, you know, big, I don't want to say money matches, but this was a big effing deal payoff kind of, kind of match. So Tano Belt. So with Macho Man coming to the ring, you know, of course, Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby the Brain Heen were playing up that these guys are going to be on their toes. They're, you know, they're thinking like this is their last match. They got to put out all the stops. So, of course, what does Macho Man do? He doesn't look scared. He doesn't look like he's, you know, he's concerned. He comes in, of course, the way a king always comes with his queen by his side. And, of course, the jobbers are carrying him down the aisle. But, I, but here's the twist, Reflectionites, because I want to talk about the warrior. The warrior comes down, and symbolically, if everybody remembers the Reflectionite, for Reflectionite purposes, TW, what does the warrior always do 999 times out of 1,000? He runs down the ring, shakes the ropes, and all that stuff. He gets in the head and makes his opponent scared, you know, kind of like the Undertaker appeal. He makes him scared because he's coming down. But what right. does he do for WrestleMania 7? He walked. He, he walked to the ring. So that was very important because symbolically, Reflectionites, and TW, you could, I'll say what I, I thought in my 1991 professor head. I was like, this man is taking this seriously. This man is a little bit nervous because he knows one misstep, and that's goodbye Ultimate War because he never kind of like – played his hand, if you know what I'm saying, TW. He never showed fear. He never showed concern. Walking down the ring, 
which he did to me showed concern. What say you, TW, about him doing that? Concern, <laughs> respect, and uh, conserving energy, intelligence. But the irony here is one year before, so I'm going to assume this was Warrior's idea to boot. Okay. One year before was the return of those carts. Ah. <laughs> what? These carts. Remember mm-hmm. WrestleMania 3? That's what this yeah. is from. And WrestleMania 6. So WrestleMania 6, Hogan said he's not taking the cart, and they wanted to make Warrior take the cart, and he literally, as he left the gorilla position, said, Vince, I'm not taking the cart, and ran to the ring to the Sky Dome, which is probably the longest he ever ran in his life, and could have blown the whole match, which is probably why Vince wanted him to not run. Uh, mm-hmm. Because he'd get all blown up for the thing, but he ran one year earlier in defiance when they're telling him to take the damn thing. Hogan did his walk; he didn't run. Um, mm-hmm. But but Warrior wasn't gonna let Hogan upstage him by him taking that card. The guy who normally runs and Hogan gets to walk it. Um, but then a year later, and and I tried showing it on the screen. Mm-hmm. It's under the under the trench coat. I love the fact. First of all, the picture of the two of them, they both had the belt. Mm-hmm. And then on the back of his tights is a picture of the same belt, and it says, much more than this. Meaning, this was this is higher stakes than that title belt. Like, I'll win mm-hmm. that title belt again someday. He didn't, but today, it's about saving my career, and also, by the way, getting rid of this fucking nuisance. Because that's why he wasn't champion. Mm-hmm. And, so- oh, by the way, Macho Man fucking killed him with that... Uh, no, like wait. That but, light but, gear. Okay, yeah, but so before match. right before. Uh, well, we if you want to go back a little bit, I just wanted to kill them. He he knocked him down so stiff when he was running. He did the little sneakaboo when uh, mm-hmm. he was chasing Sherry. Then he picked that light rig up and literally, like a hockey player does a cross check, but threw it as he hit him. And I just thought he don't like him. Like there, there's legit heat there because he does not kill a care if he breaks this dude's back with that light rig. I don't, I don't know if, uh, if he killed him, I think it was a kind of a, a lighter prop. I don't know, that's, just, that's just my thing because I, I think Macho man for Royal Rumble purposes, reflection nights, he's talking about the light, the light rail that he, that, you know, the stage light, whatever you want to call it. He kind of like placed Stand. it on his back. The light stage, the light he kind of placed it on his back and then made it look like he was going to drop it. It didn't look and like he, he dropped it. But he, he kind of cr- And that's what yeah. made it look worse. Yes, he probably visually it looked worse. It fall. Yeah. Right. But again, but the scepter to the eyes was a little bit more like, oh, that's that a seat. Yeah, that, that was, was stiff. stiff. So if we're going to go with the Royal Rumble things that look kind of stiff, the light stand was kind of flyweight to me. The heavyweight part was the scepter. But that's neither here nor there. Let's go back to WrestleMania 7 because I want to focus on this because, like you said, he walked and visually he was holding up certain things. He had – he symbolically walked, like I said, you said concern, respect, conserving energy. I thought you were going to say something like, Vince, I don't want to run. I want to make it more symbolic. I want to give more feel. Like he was fighting to just do that. I think, again, I, I don't think a lot of people, in my mind, TW, give Warrior enough credence if, and you know where I'm going with this. like For not, anything. Well, for anything, again, because, again, mm-hmm. his politics, you know, people were turned off by his politics. But, again, we're not talking about that. But I don't think it, people give him enough credence for thinking, you know, reading the room, if you will. Reading what this match entails and walking really was very prevalent. That's what I'm just saying. Because, again... Nope, there was no, I'm not even talking about an arm bar. I'm not talking about a headlock. I'm not talking about a shoulder block. TW. I'm just talking about the walk before the bell rings. I think right. that's very prevalent because symbolically, it just made this match very big. So I just wanted to say that agree, disagree, or have a different take. 100% agree. I, like, he, to put in layman's terms what you're trying to say, no one ever give him credit for having a mind for the business. He fucking did. At least mm-hmm. his brand. Maybe mm-hmm. not for everybody else's, but for his brand, he did. And <clears throat> you know, I don't want. I'm not going to give away the finish. Most people should know it. I like the fact that Macho Man kicked out of his finish. Like it, it could have been he kicks out of his, and then uh, Macho doesn't kick out of his. To me, that's a burial, right? Because that's mm-hmm. what it, 
By the way, that's also what it looked like to me as a kid. When Macho hits him five elbows at the top rope, I'm like, okay, on one hand, if this is how he goes out, it looks like, well, what could you do? He took five elbows. Of course, one normally one man's beat, but he didn't pin him after each one, right? Right. So taking five almost just looks like walking dead style, stomping a head to kill a guy instead of shooting him or stabbing him with a, with a fork. You, you stomp it until there's no head left. That's what it felt like. And as a kid, not knowing the politics and whatever, um, the uh, it, it just – it felt like he was done. Like, like even if he does come back from retirement, it ain't going to be here. This is going to be back in world class or something like that. It felt like a burial. So when he kicked out and that place went bananas when he kicked out. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then he, he, it was just, it's so well done. And I wish, I, I wish I knew who came up with what, like whose idea was it to do that? Whose idea was it? Macho man. Well, again, since you're saying that, you know the reputation of Macho Man Randy Savage. Everybody knows the reputation of Macho Man Randy Savage. He is very meticulous. He was meticulous with Steamboat in one of the greatest matches still ever to this day. He was meticulous with Diamond Dallas Page. He was meticulous with Jake the Snake. I am guaranteeing you, TW, that he was very meticulous with the way this match was going to go. Because, again... You're not doing career versus career doing during the loops. You're doing cage matches. You may be doing no disqualification, lumberjack matches, and all the stuff that you do on the loops for the MSGs, the Boston Guards, and so on and so forth. So you're not practicing. You're only taking certain instances from those matches, and you're going to put them into the career match. But again, I think we have to give more credence to Macho Man leading this for a finish, leading this for a payoff. Agree, disagree, or you have a different take. Oh, I, I would think he had some say in it, but but I also think that if I'm him, I don't get pinned with a foot. You know what I mean? Like, but again, it's definitive, right? Mm -hmm. And and one good thing that comes out of it is what we're talking about is is you almost need it to be that. So that's why I think maybe Pat Patterson had his fingers in here or Vince mm -hmm. because it's that's it. It's a wrap. Like there's no deny. He didn't hook a leg and grab a rope. He didn't pull tights. It's a definitive pin and then you just feel like this is it and and then what happens afterwards we'll talk about that then it's that much more emotional and not watching it 20 years later or 20 30 fuck it's 29 years later i think yeah what year 90, was this 91 oh shit so it's 20 32 years later i'm not gonna lie to you man i teared up at the end of this shit because of everything involved and and mm -hmm. Just like, wow, man. Like, speaking it, it of was, which, speaking yeah. of which, because I want to at least put the elephant in the room before even the match started, you have to remember the astute eye of Bobby the Brain Heaton. Because yeah. before the bell rang and before even Macho Man was coming down with the queen by his side on the on the on the king's gurney, whatever you want to call it, I forget what it's called. But chariot. The chariot. Yeah, that's a good word. The chariot. Bobby the Brain had a good face. He had a good acting face because while Gorilla Monsoon is looking at his monitor like a lead play-by-play -play man does, Bobby mm -hmm. the Brain, he, as the color guy, has the uh, latitude, if you will, Reflectionites, to look around the crowd and look at the ambiance if he wants to. Uh, you know, soak it all in. But he looks to his right. He squints his eyes. And he has a good vision because it's hard to really see, but he's he said he's pointing like gorilla look who's that over there look who is that oh that it wasn't adam cole sitting over there no 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 <laughs> he was like look at that over there and he was like cameraman bear with me go over there and look who was sitting there she didn't have good seats by the way but it was the lovely miss elizabeth and like you said tw it added a big dynamic because miss elizabeth was got a got a ticket to watch her ex, well, supposedly, her former uh, man, uh, her former, baby daddy, uh, baby daddy her oh, former clientele, she because she was the manager first and foremost. But of course, the history of it was they were already broken up since '89. The mega powers imploded, exploded, and Miss Elizabeth chose Hogan. Then she kind of stayed away, stayed behind the scenes. She did her thing, you know. She made some guest appearances and fuck with Macho Man when he was Macho King. So it was apropos, T.W., to see Miss Elizabeth, not front row, but in the middle of the uh, aisleway, 
had a had her you know had her ticket to watch this career ending match. What say you about not only the placement of where Miss Elizabeth was because she wasn't front row, she wasn't at ringside, she was by the aisles. What say you was it kind of weird or it made it more prevalent that she was right there to be like not seen and not heard by Macho Man and even by Queen Sherry. Right, that was the whole point. Like, do not close the box. Put it to the I'm side. Not, I'm not putting the Put it to the side. Me. I don't want to hear it. Um, basically, you like um, fucking with you like fucking with me with these boxes. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus didn't do it. Um, yes. Anyways, uh, she she had to be out of sight, out of mind, because otherwise he doesn't have the element of surprise when he turns and sees her at the end. Which again, uh, Travis is in disbelief because. I was texting you while I did it. I watched this WrestleMania. The, the thing I bitch about most to you is watching these long shows and do these shows. And this WrestleMania, by the way, is fucking awesome, right? Like, mm -hmm. it, I don't ever hear props for WrestleMania 7. And I'm going to guess it's because it ends with Hogan beating Slaughter. Who cares, right? So but the opening match is the Rockers versus Haku and... Barbarian. barbarian and on paper you're like well this is gonna suck and it was awesome and the like i say this I've, it's been a while since i said this add this la coliseum to the list of places where i wish i could have had a match because i would have had that crowd right here whether i wrestled in front of 20 people or 200 or 2000 the crowd participated in my match because i i had that gift i had no problem bragging about that and I, I texted you and I'm like, there was no doubt in my mind that if the Rockers win this match, and I didn't think they did, by the way, mm -hmm. um, if the Rockers won this match, it wasn't going to be because, well, they shouldn't have won that match. And the fact that it was Haku that got pinned, it was all believable. They didn't need their finish, which makes it even more believable. They did like just the kitchen sink. They're just hitting Haku with everything and then finally a high cross body and he got him. And it, it was just such a good match. And I'm like, why don't I remember this? And and then I watched the next match. It's Kerry Von Erich, who I, I don't give far enough love to. Um, I do have a figure of his coming in the mail from Powertrain Wrestling whenever they finish making it. Um, mm -hmm. I am a huge Kerry Von Erich fan. Uh, luckily, he won the world title. Well, that some bitch would be at the top of my list above him for guys that never won a world title. Kerry Von Erich would be on that list. Um, he fought Dino Bravo and I thought, well, this is going to be the shits. And it wasn't, it wasn't as good as the Rockers match. And then it was, uh, well, remember the crowd makes it a good match because right, the crowd right. was and, into it because it but, was a rust. It was WrestleMania. Oh no, there's some WrestleManias with some dead crowds, but you, the guys are also getting the crowds into it, but they also have to be willing to be into it. Um, I can't remember all the matches, but the Rockers was a good match. Carry on. I didn't ask. Reflection I didn't ask TW to watch WrestleMania Seven. I just asked him to watch one match, yeah. and then we're going to talk about it. So it was, you know, I this was this forward, is extra credit. I did fast forward through uh, the new Demolition versus uh, Tenru and the 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 Masawa and Tenru, the like Grand that. Champion Sumo guy, and it wasn't long. Um, there was another singles match that I can't think of what it was. I think it was Boss Man versus Perfect. Yeah, and Andre turned babyface. I don't even remember that happened. Andre he turned he was baby. He was babyface in '91. He turned babyface the the year prior at WrestleMania six. Don't remember it. Yeah. Um, and so it was just it was good. And then the Brett, uh, Brett, the Brett, the Hart Foundation versus Nasty Boys. It's it's well documented out here. I'm not a big Nasty Boys fan. Also a great match. And the first time the heels went over, it was mm -hmm. babies over strong for all the way up until the Hart Foundation lost their belts. Um. I think, LOD I think, against Star and Glory. I remember, yes. That's, I know. No, that was way later. That was way I didn't get that far. I quit oh, after okay. Warrior Savage. I think Perfect Boss Man was after Warrior Savage. That's where I stopped. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just, it's a good show. It's a good show. But anyways, getting back to the original question. Elizabeth has to be too she has to be where A, the fans don't see her. Only the people who are gonna see her are the ones sitting by her, but she's kind of surrounded by those Connecticut nerds. So you really mm -hmm. can't see her. Um, but, but to get back to what you're saying about Bobby, again, I'd forgotten about this. I just thought she came from the, I, just, I didn't think anything, but in my mind, I guess I just assumed she came from the back. Um, mm -hmm. but the, uh, Bobby's kind of just looking off like, like a dog seeing something in the distance and gorilla's talking and I'm thinking, what's he doing? And he goes, Hey man, is that, is that Elizabeth? That looks like Miss Elizabeth. And, and I'm like, well done. 
those little things, right? And mm -hmm. and Macho Man doesn't know he's there. She's there. Warrior doesn't. So now you spend the entire match. If you remember her, because they didn't go back to her much after that. No, they, they panned again. the camera to her face, facial expressions during right. the match because, yeah. again, yeah. Reflection Nights, you don't know who she's cheering for. Is right. she? Does she have, like, feelings for Macho Man because she, she doesn't want him to retire, even though they've had that bad history since 1989. Or when the even if he does, she wants to be there for him to console him because they started together, they end together, whatever. Right. Are. But you also have to wonder, like, does the warrior have her there? Like, mm -hmm. is, and I, I do have a question for you because it brought him up. Ricky Steamboat, okay, is the guy everyone and Tito, the the guys that were career baby faces, never went heel. JYD mm -hmm. maybe I don't know. If JYD was heel in mid south, but uh, that could be debatable. Isn't he career baby face? Yeah, K Kerry never went heel. He was always a baby face. Granted. Mm -hmm. People would choose to have Steamboat's career over Gary's career, but I just thought when Gary was wrestling Robo, I'm like, he was never a bad guy. He was he was a babyface in the ring, but again, the the boys didn't like him maybe partying backstage. But that's because he was thing. he was worse than Bulldog. He was right. incoherent. So that that's a different thing. So babyface with the crowd, but maybe a heel with the boys. So neither here nor there. So now let's focus on the match because again. This is the next level of the pro wrestling spotlight here, uh, Reflection Night. So, TW, again, were you expecting a five star classic or were you expecting an emotional roller coaster? And what I'm, when I mean that, because again, maybe we can compare Steamboat and Sarge because you can look at the fluidity of the movesets that made it all so beautiful. And of course, like you said, there is an emotional roller coaster, an emotional investment. Did you feel that same fluidity of movesets? Or was it more emotional for you between Warrior and Savage, what they were doing and the spots that you saw? I, You know, these days you don't ever know what to expect because you don't know how much time they're going to give something. But I, I think they gave these guys plenty of time. Obviously, I, everything I read somewhere, the setup was for eight months. They set this match up. Um, and mm -hmm. obviously they delivered. So it's hard to talk about it without having that part of it. Um, but the, the, the table was set for them to have a – uh, a banger, if you will, and absolutely, I expected it. Like Randy Savage is is like, God bless Ric Flair. I love the guy, right? But mm -hmm. Randy Savage had fucking great matches with George the Animal Steel. I don't know that Ric Flair could have, right? So Savage, Savage had great matches with Hogan. Mm -hmm. Savage had great matches with Jake Snake, with Sid. It, J Savage had great matches. So. um and, and the Warrior versus Hogan won. Two never happened. It was a great match. And and so basically, and I don't care. Like, I was listening to Dax Hardwood's thing today. I like what he said. This fucking guy's going to go and make me like him. I, uh, I don't know how it happened. but he's And he's the one I hate. I don't even care about the other guy. But Dax is the one that I have. And again, it all goes back to biting the hand that feeds you. And there would be people who would think he's doing that right now to Tony Khan. But, but. When you listen to him and you hear his passion, whatever, but he says he calls nothing in the back. He, he tells guys, I don't rehearse matches in the back. And, and that's one thing I have done. I have gotten in a ring and didn't call shit. When I wrestled Marty Gennetti, it was, hey, man, what do you do, kid? And I told him my three or four things I did. He goes, all right, we'll get him in. That's it. And then we went out mm -hmm. to wrestled one of the best matches I've ever had um, with Marty Gennetti. And I, I don't want to give him all the credit because he – he was like, fuck it, we're going to do it in the ring, and I did it, right? And that's what mm -hmm. I would say about the Warrior. No one wants to give this guy credit, whereas Ric Flair has the, the reputation of being able to have a good match with a broom, and the Warriors has the reputation of not being good, yet he had a good well, match with a, a with great analogy. Dude. Well, a great analogy with, I don't know, you talk about uh, Warrior, but I'm going to talk yeah. about Savage. Savage <laughs> kind of reminds me of today's, AJ Styles because Savage could have a good match with anybody, big or small. He did it with Andre. He did it with you could say Bundy. He did right. it with Hogan, like you said, Rick Rude, Jake the Snake, he did it with on and anybody. on. Anybody, earthquake, fucking honky tonk. He, it don't matter. Hakeem, big boss man. He had good matches, and he adapted to the environment just like AJ Styles adapts to the wrestler to make the match even better. So I give you that. Punk, like, I don't know what's happening today. Dax it's, a new, was, it's a new year, new you. He, well, you know, I've been on Punk's side since that shit happened. So mm -hmm. um, 
Dak said he saw Punk wrestle Viscera. The guy who does the show with him sounds like Dane Cook. I don't know who he is, some kind of music guy. He he laughs because he knows exactly why he said, uh, he, I watched him in a match against Viscera. Because he's asking him how he became a fan of him. And he said, it was good. <laughs> like, like, no offense to Viscera, God rest his soul. But no one's expecting him to be in the conversation with Steamboat Savage, uh, Steamboat Flair, Warrior Savage, Michaels Undertaker. But he had a good match with him. I think one of the best matches I've ever seen was Daniel Bryan versus Brock. And in the new era of Brock where he killed everybody, he didn't kill Daniel Bryan. Bryan didn't do shit to him either. But you, that whole match, you thought, he's pulling this off. Like it, This mm-hmm. is that formula, that 80-20 where the 20 guy gets the win, but he got his ass kicked for 80 of it, and he lost, and you're kind of like, oh. Whereas Kofi just got mopped the fuck up, right? And people are still mad about it, right? He didn't Mm -hmm. even get the – it was almost like a squash. I'm sure he got some stuff in there. And I think AJ versus Brock was like that, where after seeing him destroy Orton, destroy Cena, you're like, what the fuck are these guys going to do? And they went out there and were like, holy shit. Both matches, by the way, worth watching if you got Peacock is AJ and Brock and 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 Daniel Bryan and Brock. Mm-hmm. So but anyways, really- this match, there's no doubt in my mind was going to be good. There was no doubt in my mind, and I think if you're going to give Warrior all the the negative shit for the bad matches, then you got to give him the credit for having the good matches, which is ridiculous, right? Can't mm-hmm. give the guy credit for both. You, what you got to do is you got to understand that you put Warrior with somebody that can go, he's going to deliver for you. You put him in there with some fucking shit guy like Slaughter, good luck, right? Like you're not you're not going to have a five-star match when you're putting two guys in there who aren't the guys who create the five-star matches. They're the ones that have them with the other guy who create. And I'm not, I just picked but, Slaughter. But also that, that go and tell, recent. But that go and tells with maybe you got to give credit where credit is due to Vince McMahon because he taught, not taught Ultimate War what to do in the ring. But you can see that there was a little bit listen, of coaching. He's, totally yeah, he's, he's, he's yeah. a good listener. So, T.W., yeah. let's talk about, the, like, the high spots because, again, one prevalent moment here because, again, of course, Macho Man is doing the heelish things in the ring. And, of course, Queen Sherry, they got to do what they got to do to survive. And, of course, Queen Sherry is an MVP in this match. And, of course, she kind of – she showed a little leg. She showed a little booty. Again, that's why she's an MVP again. But they did what they had to do. But TW, the the spots that we got to talk about is the, the you could say the two count face spot, and you know what I mean, like the the moments where you thought, oh, this gonna be over, but it wasn't over, and it happened to both my, the fall finishes for both Macho Man and the Warrior. I think again, I'll say this: Macho Man's false finish, the the Macho Man false finish goes with Macho Man because he won't quit. He will fight to his last breath. The Warrior false finish, I'm going to say this because, I, you know, as much as you say this is your second favorite match, this is a top 10 match of all time for WrestleMania purposes, but this is part of the uh, the flaw for the professor. Super Cena? Act- no, Super Cena is okay. But <laughs> the, the acting of Warrior because Macho Man kicked out of his big move, the splash and the, and the, and the press slam and all that stuff. He kept looking at his hands. I don't mind the acting. I've seen the acting. I expect it in WWF. But there is an overacting atmosphere to it. And if you do it good, I'll, I'll give you credence to it. But if you overdo it, I'm even in 1991 TW, I was like this. Hmm. You, you, you're doing a little too much there, Warrior. A little too, a little long. too much. I think it was what's too say, long. What's say, again, that was a flaw for me. Was that a flaw for you? It, it made him look retarded, you know. And I, <laughs> and I know we're not supposed to say that word, but there's no other. Like, dude, he's still laying there dead, and you're walking out of here like, dude, he hit you five times. You only hit him once. Try it again. You know, just do it again. Mm-hmm. But, 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 here's where I'm going to disagree with you. The cell leading up to it was him saying, if the gods give me a sign that I don't have it anymore, then I will accept that. And he thought that was his sign. The warrior, remember, I don't think anyone's ever kicked out of that move before no. Monster Man did it. Monster so Man technically him, on, t- on TV purposes was the first. Yes. I'm Not sure even Hogan Andre, kicked out of I'm anything. I'm sure Andre yeah. did it. Hogan kicked out on three, that motherfucker. But anyway. Um, but he didn't anyway, kick out before three. No, no, he lost. He lost. Yeah. But, but for the warrior 
to have that guy lose to the press slam splash was a no-brainer. So when he kicked mm -hmm. out, he's like, what? Is that my sign? So then he gets up like, what are you doing? To me, well, we'll never know because this is the beginning of the end. He gets fired at the SummerSlam, comes back, and basically gets fired at the SummerSlam again, WrestleMania. So really we only had one more year of the Warrior, six months at a time, where I, I think inevitably Warrior was – he would have become a heel. What if he would have became a heel? Because I think that moment when he did that, that crowd was so like, what the fuck are you doing? Like they didn't like it at all. It was silence. Mm -hmm. And then Macho Man is dying. This was is it, kind wait, of was it silence or confusion? Both, but not okay. liking is what it was. So okay. when, when so Macho Man did something bonehead. Granted, he's delirious because he's got his ass whooped, but. He gets up and hits Macho Man, hits Warrior to, to try to beat him again, and then ends up getting pinned. But let him leave. Then you don't have to retire. But if you pay attention, he had no idea, and he was just trying to get his offense in there because he knew he was – it was like killer instinct kicking in. Like, it's kill or be killed time. But mm -hmm. I didn't like it, but it did make sense in the buildup when he said, if I get a sign from my, God, from my Warriors that this is it, then this is it. Like he was, okay. he was basically telling people, if I lose, I lose, which is weird because most guys are going to go, I'm going to beat you. And so mm -hmm. now that also made the fans believe like, damn, this dude's okay with losing, right? Like, no, you better not be. And so, like I said, I, the whole time I, I, I hated that he pinned him with the foot and I fell asleep watching this at the end. So he well, did pin him with let, the foot, let, right? Yeah, he pinned him with the foot. But before we got to the foot, he did like, I forget, not one, not two, Five not three. Tackles. Five goddamn shoulder tackles, right. and four of the five times Macho Man was thrown, was propelled out of the he had ring, to drag him back and he had to drag his ass, his dead carcass back yeah. in the ring. I like, and, and like I said, Macho Man's doing all of his stuff, his, his selling, oh, was mwah, was magnifique. Yeah. Again, for me, the flaw was the acting. Again, I get what you're saying with the gods. The, what has the gods forsaken me? Do I have it or do I not have it? I get that. It's to me, there was just a little bit of overacting. That's just me. That's it was. It I think it's what you're calling overacting is it went too long because Savage fucking sold too long before he Pearl Harbored him, right? He should have done it sooner because he's, he first goes to Sherry, then he tries to climb the rope, and then he just cuts between the referee and Warrior and knocks the Warrior down. He should have just went right for the warrior when he was standing there going, do it. What happened? You know what I mean? So I think he took too long. But but this on, yeah. on a timing scale, is it too long for like three minutes too long? Or is it you want to like like 45 seconds? What What is a perfect time? I mean, he's got to let him sell everything because he kicked right. out of his finish. Right. Mm -hmm. But but once Savage got up instead of running to that corner and then running to that corner, he should have just ran right for the warrior. You know, went mm -hmm. around the fucking yeah. ref, and you would have shaved off 20 seconds of that. And mm -hmm. that's what it was. I mean, we're, we're it, nitpicking it, a little bit, but it's still a great but, match. I'm not, but, I'm just not. But, but this is what I'm saying. What you looked at as overacting, I looked at as Warriors thinking, where the fuck is he? Like, he just keeps mm -hmm. doing the same thing because he didn't have anything to do after that. He was ready to sell. And so right. what I, what I got to know is, is it me? Or did it look like the Warrior got a haircut mid-match? This dude comes mm -hmm. out with huge hair, and when the match is, when he's all sweaty, it looks like his hair is only down to here, and you're like, what the fuck? Did he get a haircut? It was because it was wet. It was, a, and it was a weave. That's what it was. It was a weave. Where was the other pieces? It, it was all over the ring. That's what it was. But anyway, <laughs> neither here nor there. So after five shoulder blocks, shoulder tackles, Macho Man is dead to the world. He puts his, Warrior puts his foot on his chest. One two three it's over the macho man is forced to retire now the look of 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 stunnedness if you will of queen sherry not only is she stunned reflectionites but she's pissed she's pissed that her man did not get the job done and you gotta give it to Sh sherry because when sherry is pissed when she takes off her shoes and kicks you, it hurts more than her leaving the shoes on. That means a lot more. So, Don't ask feet. Whatever. She might have some metal. <laughs> she might have metals in her feet. But either way, but she was kicking the shit out of Macho Man Randy Savage, and Macho Man was defenseless. Nobody, like you said, TW, before, earlier, nobody knew Elizabeth was there. 
Only the cameraman kind of panned to her, but I don't think a lot of people realize that Elizabeth was sitting where she was positioned. Then the strobe light or the spotlight hits the, the middle aisle and Elizabeth jumps the guardrail, comes down, she does a great running and snatches Queen Sherry's hair and buries throws her out. Just it, buries her. Buries her. And it was like a Royal Rumble match. She eliminated Queen Sherry over the top and she won the Royal Rumble. Macho Man is dazed <laughs> and confused. Miss Elizabeth is, is, you know, consoling her ex-man, her ex-client, whatever you want to call it. And and you put it this way, T.W., this is now where it gets soap opera be, and this is so great. Everybody is trying to cheer Randy on. To, it's like, give Elizabeth a hug. Give Elizabeth a hug. She was there to save you. We're trying to tell Savage she's not the one beating the shit out of you. It was Queen Sherry. And by the time he gets his faculties all in order, of course, what happens, Reflectionites, the hug heard round the world in one fell swoop, T.W., the fans, let's say the match lasted for 18 minutes, right, T.W.? Let's just put a hypothetical. 20 minutes. 20 minutes prior to the match, you was booing him out the building. 21 minutes later, you was giving him a standing ovation and the hug, and they reunited, and it felt so good again. You said it. You cried. You had a little tear in your eye. Dude, and, of course, the after effects. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> hold, hold your thought. The after effects, and you got it again. Like we, like I said, I, you have to, have to give Warrior some credence for his psychology and what he was thinking about in the ring. Let's give credit where credit is due to Kevin Dunn. The motherfucker, I don't know if these were plants. I'm trying to hope that this was organic, but if there were plants, they were some good ass actors. This was Hollywood, so give or take. But he panned, he found three people. He found an eight year old kid crying, he found a red headed girl crying, and he found another woman crying. But he caught the tears. I saw a man, I saw an older guy crying. And fun fact that eight year old kid crying right there is that mm -hmm. same dude who cried in Chicago when CM Punk came out of <laughs> AEW. Same guy. All grown up. And he had, All grown uh, up. Yeah. Oh, God damn it. But now, T.W., <laughs> explain the emotions that you was feeling, just like I was feeling in 1991 when we saw the hug. Uh, maybe the crying is a little bit. I wasn't crying. I was just happy. But what say you? Right. Well, in 91, I was like, oh, this is cool. I wasn't. I didn't have the emotional attachment I have now. For now, just knowing they're both not here anymore, mm -hmm. knowing how both of them died, both pretty tragic deaths. And like, I have this thing, I don't know if I've ever said it on this show, and, and I just, it's fucking cuckoo, I'm sure, you know, I'm right up there with other people. But I always think, what if all the stuff we have on video, when we watch it, what if on the other side they get reanimated and they're together again because we're watching it here on in this side of the, the, mm -hmm. the death and the other side, right. like, hey, Someone's watching us, and they get together and go, oh, man, look at this. And Warrior and Savage are like, whoa, watch this spot right here. Like, that that's something that makes, I like. I hope that's something that's on the other side. Right? Like, I don't know why that popped in my head, but I think it's somewhere along the lines, like when a celebrity dies, especially if they're an artist, a, a singer or, or an athlete or whatever, where, they're, where, they're, where they have work out there that people are going to watch again. And so mm -hmm. someone, someone always says, oh, she's gone, but she'll live on through her music. And then... It just made me think, like, man, I wonder if every time we, like, like, almost like a notification on Facebook, like, they're in heaven or hell, and when someone right. plays a Whitney Houston song, bing, and she gets to look at her little thing and go, someone's listening to you right now in 18 different countries, you know, like, you're, you're mm -hmm. still over, kid. Um, and I just, I just think, I just remember watching it, and also, another one that got me was Boss Man versus Perfect, the referee's Joey Morella. Bobby Heenan's ringside and Andre the Giant comes out. And I'm like, they're all dead. Every fucking one Jesus of them. Jesus Christ, it's you always had to be the death keeper or the gatekeeper. What is wrong with you, man? Because I start, oh, and Warrior and Macho Man, the ref is Dave Hebner. And he just died. And it's like, Sherry's dead. Uh, Elizabeth's dead. Heenan and Gorilla are dead. It's it's just dead city. So, like, you could almost crush his dad in one of the matches. Um, so, no one's so, dead in the So we're changing Gary the name to Bravo. death. We're, we're changing it to Dead Mania? You want to call it Dead Mania? 
Okay. Heaven, heaven made it. Russell. All I, all I just asked you is about the emotions of, of them hugging but yeah, and but the that, crying. That wasn't, that wasn't one of my moments. My, You know my two moments. One is the warrior coming back mm-hmm. to save Hogan, and the other is um, is uh, Eddie Guerrero and Benoit in the ring together after Eddie won the world title, and Benoit just showed up. They're just they're real, heartfelt. The warrior coming out isn't his – the emotions me and my three buddies have, and we're jumping around like little fruitcakes, hugging each other because the warrior. You, as soon you, as that you, cry, you cry for the return, but you didn't. Cr- but now you you didn't cry for the hug when the the girl was the crying. The symbolism and, of it, yeah. And, and no, the CM I, Punk I, kid I was crying. I, you know what I thought when I saw him? I thought I'm glad they had that moment because they they weren't together long after that. The very next WrestleMania is Flair saying she was mine before she was yours. All that mm-hmm. stuff ran through my mind. Like man, that was. That's I told you, Macho Man. I think he said it to DDP. He said, "Yeah, bro, uh, I put my wife in an angle, and um, she's not my wife no more." You know, mm-hmm. and and that's the truth. And I I I, I fear for Cardona. Whenever I see Zack Ryder and his wife is anywhere in the thing, if they do an angle where she turns on him and goes, it's over. The second you, that happens, you it's can do over. an angle in the Indies, but you can't do an angle in WWE because then that'll equal to the divorce. Forever. So yeah, with the with that being said. Let me just say this, and I want you to either agree, disagree, or have a different take. 1991 TW, Vince McMahon can actually, I don't want to say this because it's kind of, I don't want to give too much uh, credence for this, but it has to be said. He can control the crowd. Like I said, 20 minutes prior to the match, he was booing him out the building. 20 minutes later, he gets a standing ovation. That's lost. That's a lost art right now today, TW, in my humble opinion. I don't think you can control the crowd to boo or cheer you because, again, heels get cheered a lot more because of what they say. You're trying to boo them out of the building. Yeah, the cool factor. So, you know, it's hard to do that. It's hard to manipulate the crowd to get what you want. Vince McMahon got the perfect emotion out of the crowd for this match. Agree, disagree, have a different take. This is, it's a lost agree. art to me. It's a lost art At, to me. So, of course, I'm going to turn this into myself. Don't when I started in the wrestling business, I was too hot. Tommy Wonder wrestled Rico Rodriguez. My our first eleven matches. Always t- t- the first one was a win for him. Second was a win for me. The next nine were draws. And uh, then we do tag matches where I had a partner versus him and another partner. And John Muse, I'll never forget it. Because I didn't want to be a good guy, right? Rico was the good guy. I was the heel. I love being a heel. Most heels mm-hmm. will tell you they love being a heel. But they're not all good at it. I, I like to believe I was good at it, right? But mm-hmm. I also inevitably became a good guy almost my entire – anywhere I wrestled, I almost – except for Canada – because Canada was where they cheered the good guy and booed the bad guy, no matter what. They just mm-hmm. did it. It was like a time capsule. So was Lima, Ohio. Taylor, Michigan, on the other hand – was the opposite of that. So when they sat us down and said, hey, we want you guys to be Los Rudos, Rico, and you got to pick a Mexican name. That's how I got Calavera. I, I wanted to stay with Tommy Wonder, but I lost that fight. And John, you said to me, the first month we did this, we, we did a singles match where I was in Rico's corner. I didn't wrestle, Rico wrestled. The next month I wrestled and Rico was in my corner. He didn't wrestle. And then the next month, the two of us fought the two guys that we wrestled singles. And he flat out told me, he said, the first month, no one's going to know who you are. You're going to get booed. He was the second month. You're going to get booed. But some people are going to be like, hey, we kind of like this guy. The third month, you're going to have your match. You're going to get booed by the whatevers and cheered. He goes, but when we do that return match and you fight those same two guys, you guys will be the baby faces. And I'm like, there's fucking no way. Like, we're stealing hubcaps from cars and using the cheat to win, all that shit. Like, Rico lost this match, and then I won mine. Um, and then uh, the tag match, I think it was a schmaz. And then the next month, sure as fuck, we were good guys. And he nailed it. He told mm-hmm. us, he goes, he goes, this is a different crowd. He goes, they, they like heel, but they also are picky. And they got to give you the, the, the test first to see if they're going to like you or not. And sure enough, and it's it's just like like this is what I like. It's like you know you know my long uh, love affair with the IWC YWC as you call it. Absolutely, um, I love it when someone sticks it to them. And almost every time, and no different with Austin, he's a bad guy getting sheared, bad guy getting sheared, bad guy getting sheared. Turns good, 
all the while you still think you're cheering a bad guy, but now he's not doing it to Brett and baby faces anymore. He's doing it to heels and you don't even realize it because he's still doing the same shit, but he's doing it to the bad guys. And yet mm-hmm. you started cheering for him because he was a bad guy. And now you're full on cheering a baby face without even realizing it. And that's what happened with us. We, we beat up the good guys. And next thing you know, we're fighting Demore and his partner and defending America's honor against Canadians as Mexicans. It was fucking hilarious, but we were the baby faces against heels. And it just almost like once they started cheering us, it didn't matter who they booked us against. They were going to cheer for us and they could have kept booking us against baby faces, but then that would have killed them. That would have killed the baby faces. Right. So mm-hmm. you got to, so they put us against heels and we got over same way. It was, it was to me, like you just said, Vince did it. It was insane that John Muse told me four months ahead of time, this is how it's going to happen. And it happened exactly the way he said it. I just was like, how the fuck did you know? He's like, I just, I just know this town, man. <laughs> He's like, they're well, just, it's like you said, he knew, he knew the town. He knew the, he knows the people that are coming in, but this is a different thing. This is Vince McMahon it's touring the, the country. Yeah. He's touring the world. So to get the, the manipulation of the fans, the way he wanted it to get the reaction that he wanted, that's a lost starter because I don't think he he couldn't do that in the 2000s. He hardly does that. And again, it's a different disagree crowd. Just just agree. Hmm. I got two guys. I got two guys. Three guys. Three guys. But one of them's the we'll, 90s. We'll put a bow in it so this way we can get out of here because we already yeah. all ran it. I know. You know, see, still in your bed with her strap on. Anyways, mm-hmm. he gave you the rock, and you fucking end up cheering for that guy. He might, he might have took the long way, but the guy's one of the most over guys of all time. And the other two guys, one's your guy, one's my guy, who used to be your guy. And you know who I'm talking about? Look, they're right next to each other. Roman Reigns and Cena? Bam. Mm-hmm. They are the, whether you fucking admit it or not, motherfuckers, even though they booed them every chance they got, they liked them both as heels, hated them when they turned face. Inevitably, they're liars. It's just like Nickelback. Everyone says they hate them, yet somehow they sold 30 million albums. Fuck you. There's 30 million people out there listening to Nickelback right now who's on Twitter going, fuck Nickelback, and then going, this is how you remind me while they eat their dinner. It's all bullshit. People are well, you, your favorite thing. And, and by the way, you are the first person I've ever heard say it. Maybe you'll give credit to wherever you got it from. I hear people, Joe Rogan just did it the other day, and, and I shared that post, tribalism. You, you are the first person to turn me on to that term, and that's mm-hmm. what we are. Everybody wants to shit on the same thing. Everybody wants, everybody loves an underdog, but everybody loves a fucking fall from grace. It's, and I don't mean me. I mean mm-hmm. these fucking assholes. The, the, the squeaky mice is getting the you, getting the. the you kick aside. I, I wish I could take credit for that, but no. It, it, I just heard the term, and the term is just it's poisoned everything. It, yeah, it's tribalism has poisoned it, everything. So, and that's that's the bad side of social media. Is before people just didn't give a fuck. Now they feel like they have to pick a side just to get the. I I, I saw a thing uh, a girl today. She said things that need to stay in 2022 on TikTok, and she goes, "I know, you're addicted to that notification, and that's what we are. I'm no different. I'll go mm-hmm. four or five days without checking my Twitter, so that when I do, there's like 50 notifications, and then when I do it." Fucking 49 of them are shit that I don't even have nothing to do with. They're just like, maybe you want to read this. No, I didn't, motherfucker. I want to see if someone clap back at me when I just humbled their ass. And and I love it when there's none because that means they were like, okay, I'm done getting my ass verbally destroyed by this dude. So I'm just going to not respond anymore. But, yeah, we're what addicted a, to the fucking uh, the thing-a-jig. What a world we live What a world we live in, Reflection Ass. And with that being said, we close on this debut episode for 2023. The PWR Spotlight, Greatest Babyface Turns, Macho Man Randy Savage, and of course the end result of the hug with Elizabeth at the WrestleMania 7 was the the match made in heaven when they got married, quote-unquote, at SummerSlam 1991 at Madison Square Garden. That being said, TW, give out those socials so we can get out of here. And before you do that, it's time to go episodic again. It's time to go to the land of extreme. And you have the cock. Not my cock, but you have the cock, right, TW? AOCs. Okay. So I want you to go on the cock and find an ECW, find the ECW episode from January, the first ECW episode from January of 1999, when they did from the Madhouse of Extreme in Queens, New York. All right, TW? First one of 99, house show. Yes. Yes. All right. You got it. 
And with that being said, TW, give out those socials so we can officially get out of here. All righty. Hameen Media Group at podbean.com. And they also can be found at channelattitude.com, the Hameen Media Group. Our handle on Twitter is at pro or at PW Reflection. Um, and then I brought him up, Travis. Please hit him up. Tell him to get more active. Uh, at Nuts and Bolts PW. Uh, Big Ray somehow thought JB was coming on here. So hit up JB. Tell him to come on here at the P1JB. And then, of course, Big Ray Hernandez. All of his social media handles are at Big Ray Hernandez. TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Grinder. He's on all of them as Big Ray Hernandez. You know, he's like, you guys matched on Grindr. Uh, and then mine are at Tommy Wonder 19 is Instagram and my one Twitter. The other Twitter is at the Tommy Wonder, which is also my TikTok. Snapchat is number wonder. Facebook.com backslash Tommy Wonder. Uh, and last night I spent a, with my two of my daughters, the one instance, we watched a couple different dumb, dumb duo and an idiot YouTube videos, watched Strumming Fish if you haven't, and then watched our version of Hot Ones. Those, I think, are the two funniest. So I, I've been talking to them, and I'm like, we're, we're, we're getting close. We're going to try to do two a month at least. And uh, Finally. The first, the first one I think we're going to do is the, the, the new version of the Pocky One Chip Challenge. Did it once by myself. That's on Facebook. Uh, Kick my ass. The entire time I did it, I looked at the camera and said, do not do this. A year later, did it again, the, that version, with Kurt Malpia of the Detroit Red Wings. That's also on the Dum Dum Duo uh YouTube. Uh, he no sold it like it was nothing. Me and Matt are dying. I locked myself in the bathroom at a bar to try and make myself throw up like a teenage girl. Couldn't do it. Maybe that was sent too sensitive. I should say that stuff. The but 2023 Pocky Challenge? It's 2022 yet because they come out in the fall. Oh, okay. Um, but I did my first one in January of 20. Um, okay. And then the second one I did in, in November of 21. So it's mm -hmm. just spacing it out. But anyways, um, you can get Big Veto Brand at Wix or dot Wixite .com and then Patreon.com backslash the Big Veto Brand to help Veto and Noel. Uh, and that's it. Back to you, Chip. Alrighty, Chap. But and you can find me on my Twitter at PWSOPRF. That's PWSOPROF. And if this gets uploaded by A Track Brown, this will be available on the PWSO Networks on the YouTubes. And of course, follow my brothers in arms. Billy Ray Valentine at OB1, you know me, and the king of the reactions, 8-Track Brown at the number 8, T-R-A-C Brown. And again, next week, we go episodic ECW's first episode from January of 1999 from the Madhouse of Extreme, the Elks Lodge in Queens, New York City. And with that being said, I'm the professor. That's Mr. Wonderful, the Tommy Wonder saying good night, and we'll see you next time here at the PWR Podcast, the PWSO Networks at PowerBeam.com. Peace! Oh yeah! Dig it. <laughs>